All right, we want to uh, continue this morning in our study, our, our looking into the Word of God to understand peace in the midst of the storm. Uh, the Bible tells us that we are moving toward a time when men's hearts, these are the words of Jesus, when men's hearts will fail them for fear and for looking after the things which are coming upon the earth. Men's hearts failing them for fear as they look about themselves at the things that are happening in the world and they realize that they can do nothing about it and their hearts fail them because of it. Those are the words of Jesus. But Jesus also said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let it be afraid. We want to look this morning and see how Daniel does when his world falls apart. We want to begin at Daniel chapter 6, and we're introduced there in verse 1 to a man by the name of Darius. He was the ruler of the, of the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. This was the most powerful nation on the face of the earth at that time, the superpower in the world at that time. And Darius was the most powerful man on the earth during those days. Now, because there was trouble with govern, government officials stealing, hard to imagine that, isn't it? Uh, Darius felt a need to reorganize his government. So he put together 120 lower officials and three commissioners over them. Daniel was one of the three, one of three people chosen to lead the entire Nation, And I would point out to you here that Daniel was at least 80 years old at this time. But that doesn't hold Daniel back. In verse number 3, the Bible says that he was distinguishing himself. When, when they, this uh, new form of government was put into practice, Daniel distinguished himself. And what set Daniel apart from all the others the Bible says, was an extraordinary spirit, an extraordinary spirit. Now, this doesn't mean that Daniel was just a likable fella. You know, uh, he just, everybody loved Daniel because he had a great personality and so on. Maybe he did, but it was much more than that. We know it was the hand of God upon Daniel that set him apart from all of the others. And the Bible says there in verse number 3 that the king uh, planned to appoint Daniel over the entire kingdom. In other words, Daniel was up for promotion, but he was up for something else as well. He was up against jealousy. Look there at verse 3. Then the commissioners and the other officials began trying to find ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. Everybody had their eye on Daniel, hoping to catch Daniel in some blunder. You know, politics really hasn't changed much. There, there is, even today, people who will do anything in order to obtain a place of power. Daniel found people like that around him. Of course, they, they watched him. Of course, they looked, and uh, they wanted to find some negligence maybe in Daniel or maybe something he was overlooking or some corruption. Maybe he's stealing uh, like we are. Uh, but they looked, and they could find nothing, nothing at all to to accuse Daniel of, except the Bible says in verse number five, in regards to his relationship with his God. One of the things you're going to see in this passage of Scripture is that Daniel was constantly serving God. The word is used several times, constantly serving God in his life. 
It was his relationship with God that was so distinctive, so distinctive that everyone else knew about it. And these people knew this is the only way we're going to get Daniel. And we learn right away their plan, beginning at verse number 6. The Bible says there in verse, actually in verses 6 and 7, the Bible says that they came together. These lesser officials along with the other two uh, commissioners, they came together and they worked together, all of them, in order to stop Daniel in his work. You know, it's amazing to me how the enemies of God can work so well together, how they can work in perfect harmony. But many times the people of God, and I say this to our shame, many times the people of God have a hard time getting along. The church many times is split and fragmented. Even though we're taught by the Lord Jesus, by this shall all men know that you're my, my disciples if you have what? Love one for another. And John went so far as to say that this is proof of our salvation. We know, John says, that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. <laughs> Here are the enemies of God united together against Daniel. Now, you remember the priest uh, needed authority from the Roman government in order to crucify Jesus. That's why they went to Pilate. Here, these men also need authority from Darius in order to get rid of Daniel. And so they go to Darius asking that a new law would be put into place. Verse 7 tells us that here is the law. Anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, Darius, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, all you need to do, Darius, is sign this document. We'll take care of the rest. You know, honestly, the king, Darius, should have smelled a rat. But he was so flattered by this proposal. Everybody's going to pray only to you. He was so flattered by this proposal that he goes along with it. Verse number 9 tells us that he signed uh, the, the document and everything began uh, to roll. Again, we see that Satan is always trying to get the people of God to compromise. You remember Pharaoh, of course, how he tried so hard to get Moses and the children of Israel to compromise. Yes, you can go, but go tomorrow. Yes, you can go, but leave your children behind. Yes, you can go, but leave your livestock here in Egypt. Yes, you can go, but don't go far away. This is the way that Satan always works, trying to get the people of God to compromise. What will Daniel do? What will Daniel do? Well, notice there in verse number 10. The Bible says that Daniel knew when the document was signed. Daniel was aware of the scheme uh, that was plotted against him. Notice that Daniel does not confront them as some of us surely would. Daniel does not take matters into his own hands, as some of us surely would. Daniel does not ha hire an attorney, nothing like that at all. Daniel prefers to leave this matter in the hands of God. Now understand once more, compromise is knocking at the door of Daniel. It would be easy for Daniel to say, well, you know what? I could just go into my basement and pray. Nobody would ever see. I can continue my prayer like that. I don't have to pray on the roof. Uh, Daniel could have even said, you know what? I could let 30 days go by and then start praying again. There are all sorts of compromises here waiting for Daniel. Anything to get through 30 days. Anything to keep myself from being thrown into a den of lions. But the Bible tells us that Daniel continued. 
He continued, just as he had before, this is what he does now. Now, earlier, as you came in, you should have gotten a, a, a sheet of paper. I want you to refer to it now. Uh, and uh, I want us to look for a moment at verse number 10. And I want us to see, if you didn't get one, we can just raise your hand and we'll see to you that you get one because you need one of these. Okay? We want to see the example of Daniel in prayer. First, we see that Daniel had a place of prayer. All this is in verse number 10. Daniel had a place of prayer, the roof chamber, the roof chamber. Uh, you know, when Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, he taught them to look for a place where they could be alone with God, to look for a place where they could talk to God undisturbed. Daniel had such a place to pray. We, all, we, we see a second thing, that Daniel had a promise in prayer, that he prayed toward Jerusalem. You may wonder why Daniel would do such as this. Uh, it was much more than a ritual. Friends, this was Daniel believing the promise of God. Uh, in Second Chronicles chapter 6, here's what the Bible says. If they take thought in the land where they are taken captive... God knew already they were headed toward captivity. And God had a plan even for them while they were there. If they take thought in the land where they are taken captive, if they return to you with all their heart and pray toward their land, I will maintain their cause. That was a promise from God. In that dark place, in that difficult place, in that time of trial, God promised that he would be with them and maintain their cause. That's why it's important, by the way, to have a Bible in your hand when you pray so that you can read what God has to say, so that you can understand what God wants for you uh, in your life. Daniel had a promise in prayer, and so must you. Thirdly, we see that Daniel had a practice of prayer. He continued. He continued. What he had started, he continued. The time, friends, to start praying is before our accusers come. The time to, to start praying is before we step down into our valley. Uh, the time to start praying is, is before we enter into the fiery furnace or into the lion's den or wherever our life may take us. Daniel continued the practice of prayer. Nothing changes in his prayer life just because he's in trouble. What a contrast that is to so many people. And so many people, the only time they ever play, uh, pray is when they're in trouble. Oh my, <laughs> we better pray. We better pray. Daniel had a practice of prayer. We see, fourthly, that Daniel had a position in prayer kneeling on his knees. Daniel knew how to humble himself under the mighty hand of God. You know, many of us, most of us probably, are too casual in our prayer life. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. When was the last time you got on your knees to pray? When was the last time you felt such a, a sense of urgency to come before God that you humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God and slipped to your knees in prayer? Well, Daniel knew how to humble himself under the mighty hand of God. We see fifthly here in this verse that Daniel had a priority in prayer. That was three times a day, three times a day. You know, it's easy to skip praying when everything's going well, when everything's just right uh, in our lives. Well, friends, if it's easy for you to skip prayer, when was the last time you just prayed? We need to get our priorities straight, and prayer needs to be a priority in our life. Notice sixthly, Daniel had a position in prayer, a petition rather, in prayer. 
praying and giving thanks before his God. Two things Daniel incorporated into his prayer life. Asking, of course, we got that down without any trouble, don't we? We know how to ask God for stuff, don't we? I mean, we're good at that. We've got a long list of things to ask God for, but also thanking in prayer, asking and thanking. Prayer should be much more than you and I coming before God with a list of wants and please, 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 I need this, I need this. You mean you have nothing to thank God for? You have nothing that you can thank the Lord for? Daniel had a petition in prayer, asking and thanking. Daniel also had a a perseverance in prayer. The Bible says he continued to pray as he had done previously. As he had done previously. This was his habit of his life. This is the way Daniel lived his life. Prayer was a part of his life. Listen to me this morning. Lack of prayer before your trial will be your undoing in your trial. Lack of prayer before your trial will be your undoing in your trial. You know, we have the idea that we can just run to God anytime we want, ask Him anything we want, and He'll give us whatever it is that we want. Listen to the book of Proverbs chapter 1, beginning at verse 27. These are strong words, so buckle up. These are strong words from God, so pay attention. God says, when your dread comes, what is it that you dread in life? Maybe getting sick, maybe losing something that's valuable to you. What is it that you dread, that you just hate to see happen in your life? God says, when your dread comes like a storm, it'll move into your life before you know it. And your calamity comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you, as they certainly will. Listen to what God says now. Then they will call on me. God says, yeah, I know you. I, you don't pray now. You won't talk to me now. But I know when your calamity comes, when your trouble comes, you'll call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently. Oh, they'll get on their knees then, maybe even on their face. Again and again and again and again. They will seek me diligently, but God says they will not find me. Friends, we better start praying now before our world comes unraveled. We best start praying now before our world falls apart. Well, we move back to to Daniel, and we see there beginning at verse 11. You hold on to that paper. You take it home with you and read verse. You only got to read one verse and let God speak to you about your prayer life, okay? Your pastor needs you to be praying. Your church needs you to be praying. You need yourself to be praying. Well, notice beginning at verse number 1, the plot of these men succeeds. Sure enough, Uh, they find Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. You know, I believe if you pray enough, sooner or later you're going to get caught praying. (laughs) I'm not talking about, um, you know, saying grace around the dinner table. I'm talking about pouring out your heart to God in the place that you separated yourself to do that. If you pray enough, sooner or later, you're going to get caught praying. And these men catch Daniel praying. They have exactly what they want against him. There in in verse number 12, they they have what they want. They go to the king. They're going to go tattle to the king right away. And they say to him, remember the law you made. Remember all of uh, this, this law cannot be changed because it's the law of the, of the Medes and Persians. And, of course, the king said, yes, I remember all that. I remember all that. Well, we have found someone. We found Daniel. And he's not paying any attention to your law. There in verse 13, and he keeps making his petition three times a day. Now, let's understand something right here. This is very important. 
Daniel was not defying the king. Daniel was not trying to be a rebel. Daniel simply understood what Peter understood. We must obey God rather than man. Okay? God doesn't call us to be rebels. God doesn't call us to undermine our government. We understand as believers, our government is there for a purpose so we can lead, remember this, a quiet and peaceful life so that the gospel gospel may be free to run and to share. But in the final analysis, we understand as believers that we must obey God rather than men. Look there at verse 14. Well, now, evidently, Darius had a a strong relationship with Daniel, and now he's deeply distressed. He realizes he's done something he shouldn't have done. You know, it's amazing how some people can be so smart and so dumb at the same time. You ever notice that? Um, If you haven't, just just watch me for a little while, okay? Uh, Again, the king should have, have known what was going on, but he let his ego get in the way. And Paul warned all of us about that, not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. Listen, our egos, our pride will destroy our ability to have sound judgment. We get so full of ourselves, we can't think straight. We can't think right. And so now in verse 14, Darius set his mind on delivering Daniel. He did his best to get Daniel out of this mess. He did his best to right this wrong. Noble intentions to be sure, but it was too late. It was too late. Well, these men come back to Darius and and remind him again, you remember your law? You remember what you said about anybody who broke the law? It must be done. The law is the law. Now, I've told you this before. I'll tell you again. I worry about people who are always waving the law in my face. You better watch out for people like that. I prefer people around me who believe in grace. Amen? No? I I want people around me who believe in grace. I need people around me who believe in grace. Well, here are these men waving the law. And by the way, you better be careful waving the law because it may be turned right back on you as we're going to see here in just a little bit. Look there at verse number 16. Well, nothing to do but for Darius to give the orders to throw Daniel into the lion's den. Darius has certainly painted himself into a corner. There's nothing else uh, that he can do. He's used all of his powers, all of his his energy to try to find a loophole or a way around this. There's nothing that can be done except for one thing, and that's to leave Daniel in the hands of God. Leave Daniel in the hands of God. You know, I've told you this before, and I feel like I need to remind you again. You know, if I ever get to the place, and I will certainly one day, where I'm I'm sick, it doesn't look like my life is going to last long. Listen, as quick as you can, I don't care what's wrong with me. If I've got a hangnail or if if cancer's eating away at my body, listen, as quick as you can, church, pray for me and get me into the hands of God. You do that for me, and I'll do that for you. Well, look at verse 16. I love the fact that Daniel was unashamed of his God. And people, you know, understand Daniel had a government job. He, he, was, he was a preacher or a prophet, but he had a government job. He had a regular job, just like many of you or all of you do. And people on that job understood what kind of man he was. They understood the faith that he had in his heart. And they understood the God that he served. Even when he was around the king, the king got the message from Daniel. 
And so now in this hour, Darius says to Daniel, your God will himself deliver you. Your God will deliver you. You know, coming to the end of ourselves, as Darius does here, is not a bad place to be. I know many of us, we, we like to feel like we're in control. We, we like to think that we have things in hand. But coming to the end of yourself is really not a bad place to be. Coming to the place where we can only trust in God is not a bad place to be. And my question for you this morning is, are you there yet? Because I'm telling you, if you're not, the circumstances of your life will bring you to that place. The things that are, are, are working about in our world today are rapidly moving us into that place where we're not going to be able to do anything ourselves, where all of this will be taken out of our hands and all we will be able to do is trust God. And when that day comes, you remember my words today, that's not a bad place to be. Well, look at verse 17. They put Daniel into the lion's den they rolled a stone in front of it. The king sealed it with his own seal. He had the other nobles come and seal it themselves. Didn't want anybody coming on the next day and saying, well, you know, uh, Daniel must have snuck out during the night and, and got away. No, that's, that wasn't going to happen here. Daniel truly was in the hands of God. Well, the Bible says in verse 18 that the king went off to his palace and spent the night. He couldn't eat. Uh, no entertainment was brought before him. And when, you know how you are, you know, when at night you can't sleep when you turn a TV on or something like that. And, and none of that was going on with Darius. He couldn't sleep. He, he couldn't think right. Just worry. Thinking the worst. Friends, listen to me. While we worry, while we fret, while we spend our restless nights, God is at work. <laughs> we fret. We wonder how things will be. But God is at work. Let us never forget that. He's always at work. We're going to see it right away. Uh, just the next morning, verse number 19 tells us at the break of day that he went in haste to the lion's den. I remember here uh, the, the, the women who came at the break of day to the grave of the Lord Jesus. I remember the men who came in haste to the, to the tomb of the Lord Jesus following the strength of their desire to know. They wanted to know. They wanted to know and hear Darius just wants to know, is God able? Is God able? You know, I believe we ought to come early looking for the working hand of God. I believe we ought to come in haste to see what God is doing. We ought to come early and as quick as we can to see what God is doing. Is he able? Come and see. Come and see. Look at verse 20. This is interesting that when Darius got to the tomb, he cried out with a troubled voice. You know, his, his, his brain was telling him, you know, there's not going to be any sound come back out of that tomb except maybe the growl of a lion. He cried with a troubled voice. Friend, what could it mean to our flesh how silly it seems, how ridiculous it seems to go to a grave and call out somebody's name? How ridiculous it seems to our flesh, how absurd it seems to our flesh to run to a grave and expect anything good to come of it. But friends, to those of us who know the Lord, we can indeed look at the grave and say with confidence, O grave, where is thy sting? We can come to the grave and expect life rather than death. 
I love the response of Daniel to Darius there in verse number 21. If you're, if you're looking there with me in the scriptures, verse 21, then Darius spoke to the king saying, O king, live forever. I guess he didn't know what else to say, but it would have been a great comfort just to have heard Daniel's voice. There's life in the tomb. There's life in the grave. Listen to the testimony of Daniel in verse 22. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. Here, Daniel is simply saying that God is able, God is faithful. And friends, that is the only way you and I are going to ever conquer the grave. That's the only way that you and I are ever going to come forth from the valley that we may find ourselves in. That's the only way that you and I will ever be able to survive the night with the lions of this world. That God is faithful, that God is able. I love verse 23. Look there. It says that no injury whatever was found on Daniel which tells us simply that God is completely faithful now wouldn't that have been something that Daniel come out here and his tours you know his clothes are ripped and scratches everywhere and you know one arm eaten off or whatever you know you know what kind of God would that be what we find here is that God is completely faithful you can put your life into the hands of God because he is completely faithful. He will never, Jesus says, leave you or forsake you. He wasn't going to leave Daniel for a moment in that night in the lion's den. Verse 24, I remember, remember I told you about the men who were waving the law around. And I told you, you got to be careful about doing that because it could come back on you. And we see that in verse number 24. Those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were then with their wives, their children, and all their families thrown into the lion's den. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed their bones. Friends, this is the honest truth. There is, there is a distinction made between the one who trusted God and those who did not. It's always going to be that way. God is looking for faith in your life and mine. There will always be a clear distinction between those who know God and those who do not, those who trust God and those who do not. There is a valuable lesson here. There is no hope for those outside of Christ. And friends, outside of Jesus, death will be your undoing. Then look at verse 25. Then Darius the king, you can imagine how excited he was about this, to see firsthand God working in such a wonderful way that the king, as soon as he got back to his palace, he he wrote to all the people's nations and men of every language. He, he wanted to bear testimony to anybody who would listen. I love this. And here's what he said. May your peace abound. May your peace abound. The peace of Daniel becomes the peace of Darius. And the peace of Darius becomes the peace of of the kingdom. And that's the way it always works, people. Peace begins in your heart. And from there it spreads to others. And more and more and more. Until peace fills the land. Again, I love the words of Jesus who said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let me ask you if you would just bow your heads here as we come before the Lord. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to remind you that today is the day of salvation. If you want to put your faith in Jesus, 
In just a moment, we're going to give an invitation. We do so because that's what the, the Scriptures encourage us to do. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And if you want to profess Jesus as your Savior this morning publicly, Pastor will be right here. I have my mask on. But I'll receive you and help you to know Jesus this morning as your Savior. Perhaps you're, you're watching there at home or wherever you may be. Let me encourage you to remember clearly that today is the day of salvation. If you want to know about Jesus, we'll be happy to help you. All you need to do is you could call or you can write in the comments and we'll help you to know Jesus as your Savior and Lord. We'll help you as you live for Jesus. We'll help you as you walk with Him. But the decision is yours to make right now.